So 65 million years ago, catastrophe wiped out the dinosaurs, and we saw the adaptive radiation of a tiny shrew-like ancestor of humans that would look more at home like next to a hamster wheel than in your family album. Let's set the stage in the thought bubble. So the slow waltz of plate tectonics continued to pull Eurasia and the Americas apart, expanding the Atlantic Ocean. Primates colonized the Americas and, separated by the vast Atlantic, continued their separate evolution into the New World Monkeys. Which is not a band name, although it should be. Then, around 45 million years ago, Australia split from Antarctica, and while mammals outcompeted most marsupials in the Americas, except animals like possums, Australia saw an adaptive radiation of marsupials. This, of course, meant that later, about 100,000 years ago, when the Americas were having their share of mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, Australia was having a spell of gigantic kangaroos, marsupial lions, and wombats the size of hippos. Then, somewhere around 40 million years ago, India India, which had been floating around the southern oceans as an island, smashed into the Eurasian continent with such force that it created the world's tallest mountain range, the Himalayas. Meanwhile, in Africa, primates continued to evolve, and 25 to 30 million years ago, the line of the apes diverged from the old world monkeys. And no, neither you nor a chimp is a monkey, nor did we evolve from the monkeys that are around today. Those are like our cousins. Moreover, we did not evolve from chimpanzees. The chimpanzees chimpanzee is a cousin as well, not an uncle. We are not more highly evolved than they are. Instead, our lines of descent split off from a common ancestor with chimpanzees about 7 million years ago. Climate change in East Africa made things colder and drier, and many forests were replaced by woodlands and wide open savanna. Life in the savanna meant our ancestors needed to run from predators rather than climbing trees, so our line shifted away from the bow legged stance reminiscent of chimpanzees and developed bipedalism, where our locomotion came from legs that were straight and forward facing. There's still some debate about when bipedalism first began, but we know that by the first Australopithecines around 4 million years ago, our evolutionary line was bipedal. This also freed up our hands. Australopithecines were not very tall, standing only just above a meter, or just over three and a half feet, and had brains only a little bigger than modern chimpanzees. They were largely herbivores, with teeth adapted for grinding tough fruits and leaves. Australopithecines may have communicated through gestures and primitive sounds, but their higher larynx meant that they couldn't make the range of sounds required for complex language. By 2.3 million years ago, Homo habilis arrived on the scene. They weren't much taller than Australopithecines, but they had significantly larger brains, though still a lot smaller than later species. Excitingly, Homo habilis is known to have hit flakes off of stones to use them for cutting. Now, lots of species use tools. For instance, chimpanzees use sticks for fishing termites out of the ground, and they use rock hammers and leaf sponges and branch levers and banana leaf umbrellas. A lot of these skills don't seem to arise spontaneously just because of the intelligence of individuals, but like in the case of termite fishing, chimpanzees pass the information on by imitation. Primate C, primate do. In a way, this social learning is sort of cultural, yet succeeding generations of chimpanzees don't accumulate information, tinker with it, and improve upon it, so that after a hundred years, chimpanzees are owners of highly efficient and wealthy termite fishing corporations. Similarly, as impressive as Homo habilis's stone-working abilities are, we see very little sign of technological improvement over the thousands and thousands of years that habilis existed. Same goes for Homo ergaster erectus, who was around 1.9 million years ago. Homo ergaster erectus had an even bigger brain, was taller, and they even seemed intelligent and adaptable enough to move into different environments across the old world. They may have even begun our first clumsy attempts at fire, which is vital for cooking meat and vegetables, opening up opportunities for more energy and even more brain growth. But still there's not much sign of technological improvement. Their tools got the job done. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yet 1.78 million years ago, we do see Homo ergaster creating a wide new range of teardrop hand axes in Kenya. By 1.5 million years ago, these teardrop axes had rapidly become common and had improved in quality and were shaped with a flat edge into multi-purpose picks, cleavers, and so forth. Archaeologists see this as the first possible sign of tinkering and improvement of technology that may have been transmitted by social learning. A faint glimmer of something new. Why is this important? Well, humans didn't get to where we are because we're super geniuses. It's not like the Xbox One was just invented out of the blue one day. It was an improvement upon the Xbox 360, which was an improvement upon 
on earlier consoles, arcade machines, and computers, and backward onto the dawn of video games. In the same way, we didn't just invent our modern society by sudden inspiration. It's the result of 250,000 years of tinkering and improvement. This is where accumulation matters. It's called collective learning, the ability of a species to retain more information with one generation than is lost by the next. This is what has taken us in a few thousand years from stone tools to rocket engines to being able to have the Crash Course theme song as your ringtone. Progress. If there was collective learning in Homo ergaster, it was very slow and very slight. This may have been due to limitations on communication, abstract thought, group size, or just plain brain power. But over the next two million years, things started to pick up. Homo antecessor, Homo heidelbergensis, and the Neanderthals developed the first systematically controlled use of fire in hearths, the first blade tools, the earliest wooden spears, the earliest use of composite tools, where stone was fastened to wood, all before Homo sapiens were ever heard of around 250,000 years ago. Neanderthals even moved into colder climates where they were compelled to invent clothing. They used complex tool manufacture to produce sharp points in scrapers and hand axes and wood handles, and they improved their craft over time. While evolution by natural selection is a sort of learning mechanism that allows a species to adapt generation after generation with a lot of trial and error and death, collective learning allows for tinkering, adaptation, and improvement on a much faster scale with each generation and across generations without waiting for your genes to catch up. Anatomically similar Homo sapiens have been around for about 250,000 years, and throughout that time we've been expanding our toolkit from stone tools to shell fishing to trade and actual fishing, mining, and by 40,000 years ago we had art including cave images, decorative beads, and other forms of jewelry, and even the world's oldest known musical instruments, flutes carved from mammoth ivory and bird bones. All this stuff came about as a result of collective learning. As long as you have a population of potential innovators who can keep dreaming up new ideas and remembering old ones, and an opportunity for those innovators to pass their ideas on to others, you're likely to have some technological progress. These mechanisms are still working today. We've got over 7 billion potential innovators on this planet and almost instantaneous communication, allowing us to do so many marvelous things, including teach you about big history on the internet. So life for early humans was pretty good, like foraging didn't require particularly long hours. The average workday for a forager was about six and a half hours. When you compare that to an average of nine and a half hours for a peasant farmer in medieval Europe, or the average of nine hours for a typical office worker today, Foraging seems downright leisurely. Anyway, a forager would go out, hunt or gather, come home, eat, spend time with the family, dance, sing, tell stories. And foragers were also always on the move, which made it less likely that they'd contaminate their water or sit around waiting for a plague to develop. And with their constant walking and their varied diet, foragers were in many ways healthier than the peasants of ancient civilizations. They were also in some ways healthier than us, but we have antibiotics for now, so we live longer for now. The lack of wealth disparity in foraging cultures may imply greater equality between social rankings and even between the genders, since female gatherers appear to be responsible for the majority of food collected rather than the hunting males. And from that perspective, life was kind of ruined by the advent of agriculture and then later with states. Despite the relatively short workday, life in the Paleolithic sounds a lot less appealing when you consider the high murder rate and also the occasional infanticide. That's not even to mention the old or disabled people who, when they couldn't and keep up anymore were abandoned to die in the wild. I can't help but feel that I might not have thrived in the Paleolithic, what with my visual impairment and general lack of interest in hunting. In any case, collective learning was really good for our survival, but then, 74,000 years ago, disaster struck. A super eruption at Mount Toba on the island of Sumatra in present-day Indonesia clouded the skies with ash and cooled the climate. Plants and animals, aka food, died off, and genetic studies showed that this reduced the human population to a few thousand people. So as a result of this, we aren't exactly inbred, but there's more genetic diversity between two of the major groups of chimpanzees in Africa than there is in all of humanity. So this small group heroically recovered and spread out of Africa 64,000 years ago, colonizing diverse environments and continuing to innovate. For 13.8 billion years since the beginning of the universe, complexity had been rising in a powerful crescendo, but in the space of a few millennia, collective learning was about to make things really bonkers. 